So my first, uh, my, my um, do this, yeah, my question is to Thorsten Polite. Uh, and you were talking about the Great Reset and uh, made a really good uh, like assessment of where we're standing with uh, like what the purpose is and you know why it's wrong and everything like that. Uh, and at the end, you gave a little bit of um, you know what what we can do to stop that. Um, but like something like what I didn't find convincing is that uh, some of the suggestions that you make are mostly oh we need to you know, make people aware, we need to convince them of um, libertarianism and so forth. But um, when, you know, reading a little bit of Hoppe, reading a little bit of um, more like pragmatic uh, people, uh, what I hear is often that like you should um, get local influence, that you should like um, actually try to get some power so that you can like isolate yourself from the effects of the Great Reset uh, and so forth. Um, so, do you think that we should have a clearer strategy on that, where like we, you know, get local power so we can shield ourselves from that, or uh, what's your what's your prescription, so to speak, on that? And you know, I ended maybe uh, yeah, I, I ended with Immanuel Kant, you know, who in 1784 wrote a very important article about uh, Aufklärung, enlightenment. And he said, at the end of the day, uh, things change when people's minds change. And you cannot run a revolution without uh, the mindset of people having changed already. And so gradually, I think we are moving there. And uh, I see optimistic signs these days where like ESG uh, criteria are getting refused by capital investors. Um, the strategy of the World Economic Forum uh, becomes increasingly public and there are bits and pieces that show that um, the Enlightenment is gaining ground. Oh, probably I could, could add, which is the, the same subject actually, uh, these ideas not to believe anymore in things you know what I, I said in my speech that I think for schemes like a state or maybe such reset agendas and things like that um, they to a certain extent they live from the fact that many people believe believe in it that they think it's true that it it does exist that that there is something like a higher being in this society even though you don't see it you know um, I, I think that that has to do with ideas, with realizing what is there. Um, the question remains, how, how, how can we influence it? It must be very strong, this, this belief in such structures, in, in the necessity of the state or things like that. It, it's, it's really heavy to, to, to show that um, that that it's it, there's no basis to believe in it. Sometimes I in my dreams, you know, I, I like to dream uh, to have daydreams. Um, I I'm thinking about the, um, the future of the state that maybe it, the state is not abolished or fighted against or something like that, but forgotten. That that it, it happens uh, maybe with the church, the traditional church, of course, people say, yes, there are churches, these beautiful buildings, but in the, meantime, the, in the meantime, they are empty. People do not go there anymore. And there were times indeed when people went there every Sunday and they believed in that and they thought that what they preach there is mandatory for them. That's, that's funny, but these times are over, you know? And in, in this respect, I think maybe the time comes when people say, yes, that's true. There is, they called it State House at the time. Today it's a museum, nice building, but um, there were people that made legislations, you know, they wrote rules and people obeyed to that. You know, this is a bit. This has to do with ideas and uh, thinking about uh, the reality. Um, my question is also on the Great Reset, and it's addressed to Torsten Pollard, but also the panel. 
And um, what I observe in, in reality is that there are changes in the current world order. And I think a catalyzing event is the Ukraine-Russian war. And, you know, the BRICs are realigning. They are intends to have a gold-backed currency. Um, China is maybe the emerging superpower, and they might, might um, replace the United States. Um, and that is one thing. And on the other side, I see that there's competition between states. So I think Austria announced it, and Czech Republic already enforced it. They had a change in their constitution to have cash money always as an acceptable means of payment. Um, so in the light of the changes in the world order that we live in, and in the light of competition between the states, is that, are those not two factors that could also um, yeah, um, prevent the Great Reset in a way? You know, we live in a world where you have many states, or as Hans Hopper put it, if many gangs competing against each other, and you might have periods where they form a cartel, or you have periods where they try to, where well, one state tries to overcome another state, and um, I think the underlying trend is towards a world, a single world government. I think that that is the underlying trend, and at the moment it seems that um, the, the United States of America, that has been at the forefront of taking this position, is uh, getting a strong competitor, namely China. And uh, now we have a situation where you have the Ukraine-Russia war uh, against the West, so to speak. And but the underlying trend is that states try to become bigger and more powerful and uh, the situation we have now that you have competing states is more favorable i would say than when you have a situation in which states form a cartel and coordinate their actions reduce the competition in terms of taxation legislation etc um, so i i think at the moment the, the growing conflicts between, let's say, the United States of America and China and Russia might stop this process a little bit towards a single world government. But you still have the United Nations, where the, these states sit together, try to coordinate their actions. Um, th these are 193 states, roughly. And um, so... I'm, I'm, I don't think that the competition among states is really solving the problem of the state. The state understood as a territorial monopolist of coercion and the right of taxation. Um, yeah, the, the, the nature of the state is aggressive. It is aggressive internally in terms of higher taxation, more regulation, more laws. And it is also aggressive outwardly. Look at the United States. If, 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 if it's militarily strong, it can do wars all over the world. And that's what the Americans have done. And um, so the solution of the state problem is, is really to get rid of the state as we know it today. Namely, by changing ideas, telling and educating people that the state rests on coercion and violence. It's not based on voluntary action. And that could be, I think, a, a good argument where you can approach people and um, make clear the underlying problem of the state, which is responsible for many, many, as you know, for many, many problems in this world. Perhaps I, I, I could add, I think, precisely out of these reasons, um, I think it's it's dangerous once many states or all states have the same opinion. There are some topics where even the big enemies are, have the same meaning, when it's about war on drugs, for instance. That's more or less international um, uh, consent, uh, consent of, of the states, even Afghanistan now, um, um, prohibited 
um, opium, um, um, uh, you know, agriculture, um, and and I think these are bad signs. You know, of course, it's uh, we talk about the reduction of the evil, of course, but um, uh, once they 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 have a consent about what drugs about terrorism sometimes. Uh, of course, about tax um, evasion. All these gangs are, you know, interested in helping each other to get their their robbed goods. Um, but but all, I think it's good that they have differences, that they have conflicts. Of course, that not yet the problem of the state as such, but um, better having states in conflicts than the big cartel. It just springs to my mind, I think a couple of years ago, uh, when especially Wall, Wall Street related interest groups uh, were cheerleading the idea of bringing the United States of America and China closer together. And the term they used was China America. China America. Terrible. It, just imagine they, these two powers would start getting closer together. That, was, that would certainly be the biggest gang on the world, in the, on, on, the, on the planet. And uh, that would be, of course, uh, terrifying because it's... That's the world state. Yeah. That, that would be actually the world state. And maybe in a couple of years' time, we, we find ourselves in a situation where Washington and Beijing come closer together, overcoming certain problems, you know? We have to team up. We have to create a unified government. So that's the underlying trend, which is dangerous, and, and it can be traced back to the existence of the state as we know it today. Uh, my question is for David Durr. Uh, enjoyed your presentation very much, um, luring us with the great optimism of a decline and fall. Um, uh, you mentioned during it this idea of the state as a firm or a corporation. And I think that's one of the modern indicators of states compared with the previous 10,000 years when they wouldn't pretend to be a firm. Uh, I live in Hong Kong, and one of the interesting changes of language was that under the British, the senior official is called a governor, implying that all he's doing is a governance role. And after the transition back to Chinese sovereignty, the head official is called the chief executive. Now, why do you call the head official the chief executive unless you think of the city as a corporation? All the uh, uh, citizens are employees, uh, and we just need to listen to the HR department of which part of the business we should be sent to. Anyway, it, in a city like Hong Kong, where you don't have foreign policy issues so much, and if the citizens think of it as a corporation, the, logis the legitimacy of the government is only impacted where the firm is seen to be incompetent and failing, which in many parts of the world, that's what's happening. And I wondered, coming back to Switzerland, are there indications that the Swiss people feel that what the government does is now failing and, and they are incompetent or is it simply um, the issue of, of not liking the Constitution, as you described it? Um, so, so these issues, to, to come to your last um, point right now in Switzerland, there are currently some movements, uh, more or less organized groups, that um, they are outraged, as I, as I told, that the state that they, they think by some top secret uh, ways the state was privatized. We didn't hear that officially, but once you look at these indexes, you know, of, of firms, you really find cantonal instances, cantonal authorities, agencies, uh, or even the Swiss Confederation in some of these indexes. Um, of course, these are administrative aspects where they enter their address because they deal with other um, actors. But these movements, this is not my approach. It's just uh, interesting to look at it. 
these these movements say that's a scandal, you know, that um, that the state uh, does not um, maintain his official functions. The the state is not an economic player. He is somebody who should, uh, you know, care for law and order, things like that. So they are outraged about that. And then I say, um, I know that there are these registers, um, but unfortunately, this is not a sign for a privatization of the state. Unfortunately, I would like that very much. If if the state is privatized, you should privatize everything, also these so-called official functions, law and order is a good that should be privatized. It's much better um, uh, organized once there is competition, things like that. Um, I, I, I made that point only to say that people realize that official actors are just actors. And um, um, I think that that could be, you know, um, the entrance to an approach where you say the typical state functions, there are typical state functions, of course, like security, things like that. Um, but there is no need that they are monopolized. There is a need that they are there, of course, because if there is a demand, there should be, or there will be a supply, um, but certainly not monopolized. Uh, and and for, for this kind of thinking, I think it's, it's useful. It could be a sign for losing the faith, again to say that, the faith in that monopolized uh, player Maybe these other examples you, you said in, in other in, in Hong Kong or yeah, um, I could imagine that that there are that maybe there are fluent fluent situation. Is that an official function or is that a, a business function and uh, things like that? But maybe it's just an illustration of the fact that um, certain official functions do not have to be monopolized. Quite, quite slightly different. That, that I doubt if many Hong Kong people think that any of the functions of the bureaucracy should be privatized. It's not the way they think. The, there's no um, whiff of corruption. People don't think the bureaucrats are corrupt. Um, so there won't be any upswelling of opinion against them because of that. The issue would not be should the government be running the health service or the education system. The only issue would be if they do it really badly. If you have an incompetent, you have an incompetent bureaucracy, that's what will get unpopular. If the health service is not working, the schools are producing kids with no education. So it, it's nothing to do with corruption or power. It's the bureaucracy has now taken so much control in the, the, the city as a firm, as a corporation, but the bosses are incompetent. And that is where I think there could be some discontent could come out from that. From what you're saying in Switzerland, it's more to do with political issues, not with the incompetence of the, the country's bureaucracy. Uh, to give you an example, I think it's a bit of the year as a startup that you want to replace Google, that you compete with Google. And it's the same way I don't think privatization of state functions will happen that way, uh, that this function will just be overtaken. It's the, the, the way change really happens is things become irrelevant. So you want to be there when things become irrelevant. And I think there's also part of the uh, reaction or losing trust in the population that has led to the, the cash thing in Austria. That's not a big insight of politicians, of course. It's just they're realizing that there is mistrust in the population. Uh, Austria is only that bit different from Germany, that it has only one big city and uh, it's more rural. So there's even less trust uh, due to the Cantillon effect, uh, but also to the urban structures. Uh, and so there's a reaction against the meme of the Great Reset, which is basically, I, I think it's mainly a meme 
uh, it, it's this Klaus Schwab thing where, oh, we are the experts, uh, we know it, and oh, I'm so misunderstood, uh, I never had a great plan, but it's of course it's the inherent idea that there's a class of experts you can trust, because otherwise they won't be at Davos if you can trust them. I mean, well, well, how should they have become a young global leader if no one trusted them? Uh, and there's a mismatch, uh, uh, so I don't see it going into a world government direction, I, I don't see things being... Uh, replaced because they don't work uh, anymore. I think things become irrelevant because they don't work any anymore. The mainstream media has not been, uh, there's, there's a question about like privatizing it. They are private entities. They're just part uh, of a flawed business model within a very distorted structure. So they become irrelevant and that opens up a vacuum that uh, entrepreneurs can try uh, <laughs> to, to stay out, uh, uh, living uh, out of that. Or you can even have philanthropic projects uh, or societal projects or things that have been around all along but weren't that considered that relevant and that important, growing in importance. Uh, so I think that's rather the way to expect these structures to become more and more irrelevant and uh, uh, then uh, things emerging in, in their place. Uh, but I share the optimism, uh, unless don't think that uh, the way towards a multipolar order and more competing political entities, that will not feel very nice, uh, in particular not in Europe. So usually these phases can, of course, lead to higher incidences of violence, uh, and we can only hope that it's rather irrelevant than a real active competition uh, between power blocks, uh, because, of course, that means some warring. Uh, so hopefully the way from a, to a multipolar order is relative to the irrelevance of some geopolitical structures and the re-emerging of other alternative protocols and ways to interact. Yeah, um, I'm Leonard Minali from uh, Belgium. Um, I have a question for uh, Thorsten Polite. Um, I, I want to start by saying that I really enjoyed all the uh, German-speaking uh, <laughs> speakers today, not only because... We try to speak English. <laughs> 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 not, not only because they were remarkably like hope, hopeful messages, um, but also because it's very much driven in like a, a very big basis of theoretical like th theory. And one of the things that you were saying was that um, you know with the world reset, they tried to kind of change logic. They have different you know uh, different. They, th they think that there's multiple logical uh, solutions, and you can do that with people. Um, but you mentioned artificial intelligence, and I think that's quite interesting because maybe another uh, pathway of hope may be artificial intelligence because, of course, artificial, artificial intelligence is dangerous because, you know, it's much easier to track down on uh, tax theft, taxation theft than, uh, uh, I mean, I, I mean uh, the tax evasion and um, other types of ways to, to track down, you know, honest people. But um, unlike humans who can be believed cer certain illogical things, artificial intelligence is, it works very badly with um, irrationality. Like, for example, Jet, chat GPT was, was um, limited um, in, in the way it responds to uh, questions about wokeism because they, they, it, it answered it very um, unpolitically correct. You know, they had to limit the, w the way it responded to messages from general uh, you know, people. So maybe artificial intelligence, when the government wants to use it to the full extent, um, it will see all the illogical things from what, what the government wants to do. They, they, they will do this there, when they want to do that there, and, and, and artificial robots will be saying, well, this is a great, this is a complete contradiction. We cannot, you know, error, computer says error, and they stop. They, maybe they stop just, what, what, what do you think about this? The, the term you refer to is polylogism. So okay. there's a variety of logics out there. It's not just one logic. And that stems uh, from the debate Ludwig von Mises had in the early 1920s with communist or socialist thinkers. They found themselves in a position where they couldn't go against the arguments coming from economics. So they and as you know, Ludwig von Mises reconstructed economics as a science uh, of the logic of human action. So he used logic to make his arguments. And the socialists and communists couldn't come up with convincing 
arguments, and so they decided to uh, to uh, to say that uh, logic is different for different people. If you if you think like in, a sound uh, in terms of sound economics, then you may be a bourgeois, and you wouldn't understand the needs of the working class. So we have to put you in prison or in, into the death camp. That was the idea of polylogism to uh, to support the socialist and communist uh, theories. You're absolutely right. If uh, I was just thinking, what what happens if we as a people uh, would lose uh, our, our grip on logic? That would be terrible. I think that would be the end of humanity. If we if we can. If we if we don't if we don't if we don't have logic as as a guiding rod, so to speak, for our lives, it would it would be terrible. And I'm I'm not sure whether artificial intelligence could really make us believe in unlogical things and disrupt uh, our capacity to to make lo logical decisions. I don't know, maybe, but that would be dangerous, I guess. I, I, maybe my question was maybe not true. I thought maybe artificial intelligence will actually signal to government officials trying to program these robots, this is, a, this is illogical and they will be on our side. That's what I tried to say. Like maybe artificial intelligence, while government will want to use them, they will not be able to use them because they will signal to government, you know, this is a violation of that, of, you, know, you know, of rights and maybe they will be on our side. That was what I. Yes, yeah. I mean, as I try to point out in my uh, my talk, uh, if people make use of logic, mm -hmm. start by thinking about the interactions among people. There are two types: voluntary action on the one side, and violence and coercion on the other side. There's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. I, I, if people would increasingly take recourse to logical thinking, yeah. and maybe. Artificial intelligence would use would be used for that purpose. Well, yeah, that would, could be a disruption of the status quo as we find it today. I think this is this is precisely uh, the, the aspect that it could be on our side. Actually, I do not think know anything about these these um, um, you know programs and things like that. But let's assume that they are they are. Um, you know, programmed by logic, logical, uh, um, you know, connections, things like that. We, we, I think it was with Alessandro yesterday night when we talked about the influence of this technique on the law. And a lot of cases could be autom handled automatically. Well, well it's, it's, it's not the goal, but let's assume things like that. And it's, these are good programs that follow the logic. And then comes the state and wants to enforce a invoice for taxes. And you resist against it and put that in the machine. And maybe the outcome is tax, taxation is theft, you know? <laughs> and that would be... <laughs> Yeah, I, I disagree uh, yeah, completely. That's not how the large language models work. Uh, I think they are inductive pattern recognition based on machine learning. So there's no logics uh, uh, really there. They can see, of course, structures that seem logical. Uh, but they are technology. They are tool like any uh, tool. Uh, and the main impact of tools is uh, they change, they reshuffle the cards in a society. They are always abused by the centralizers, the archists, as you say. And they're always employed by the anarchists to somehow withstand. And sometimes uh, it's very frustrating because the anarchists are losing. And sometimes the whole battlefield changes through really profound technological changes. Usually it's technologies that look uh, dangerous, but somehow are equalizing the uh, power. Uh, in using them. And I think there's a chance to be optimistic. Uh, obviously, the pattern recognition by machine learning 
is, is like a, a, dreaming, a, a dream as tool for totalitarians in control of something uh, that's the main use, how they'll be used. Uh, but I think there's a chance and the hope in that that they'll equalize a little bit the field of military warfare. It'll be more about like uh, algorithms that are accessible to anyone who's able to hack and understand uh, uh, how machine learning works. Uh, it's algorithms that you can pass on, that you can copy, that you can conceal, that you trans can transmit around the planet. Uh, and uh, even totalitarian governments have not been that successful in controlling that flow of information. Of course, there's a limited success to it, uh, uh, but uh, we've, we've seen that that can be circumvented. So I'd say that the internet was rather a change to the positive, even though it's mainly employed by the centralizers and the archists. But it has changed a little bit the battlefield for ideas, and I think uh, machine learning could point in that direction. But for a while, in the, in the short term, we see some pretty dystopian use uh, of that pattern recognition. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I have a question regarding uh, also the, the Great Reset, uh, New World Order kind of um, topic. Um, so I was, I was, I was thinking uh, about uh, COVID and the crisis that are, that are always used um, of, um, as, an, uh, as a good reason for uh, state intervention. Um, and I was, I was thinking about um, how it was said, I think uh, yesterday that um, that there are already uh, like over um, um, goals by the U.S. government of uh, an, a world government creating a world government, a world uh, central bank, and all of that. But um, but how how um, how if you could make a prediction how the great reset would look like in your uh, personal opinion uh, would it more be like uh, an, a war between uh, usa and russia or usa and china that is that is not meant to be one but meant to be eternal in a in a kind of orwellian way uh, to create like an, 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 a great crisis that is everlasting, because if you really establish a world government, it will be very simple for the population of the world to see like, ah, oh, it's these people, why are they doing it to us? And you can only create so many viruses and create so much climate change. I mean, people only live for uh, 90 years, but I mean, even in the history books, it will become very apparent. <laughs> that all these crises were not maybe not real you know so if you have a, a, a war you can and that is really believable isn't isn't that like a better tactic like what do you think uh, is going to happen these people all go to the davos and they all go to to davos to 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 uh, uh, uh klaus schwab's events they all are young global leaders aren't they just cooking something up to make us believe that that there is actually a war going on and they maybe are fighting and maybe are sending troops and having people die. Um, what do you think uh, it would look like? As, as I said earlier, the um, at, the, at the heart of, of the problem we discuss are ideas. If people are convinced that socialism will bring prosperity and a, a better world, they will, they will try to, to establish socialism. If you convince people that this is a very bad idea, then you can expect that, for instance, capital and liberalism or whatever will be the desired object for, for, for the people. It's, at the end of the day, it's about ideas. It's very, very important, I think, to, um, to think about it. It's ideas that make people act. And um, you ask me for a prediction. <laughs> you know, I don't know the future. You know, I'm, I'm in the business of trying to change people's ideas, to make them familiar with different ideas, different from what they learn in school and learn in university read in the newspaper. And I'm, I'm optimistic that this is going to have an impact. And so 
I would hope that the change in ideas will lead uh, people to increasingly question the state, the Great Reset agenda, um, the, the policies that are being imposed on them, taxation, etc. So I hope there will be a change. Um, and uh, making a prediction is very, very, of course, very difficult. You know, um, I mean, if if we don't change the ideas. Let's assume we don't change the current set of ideas. We're going to end up in a digital prison on a global scale. But again, I'm optimistic that this is not going to unfold, um, that there will be a change for the better. Um, today, I tried to, in my, in my talk, to, uh, to reveal the underlying theories of the Great Reset, to show that they are from the socialist and communist and even fascist uh, theory books. And I hope that is going to make an impression on people. You uh, listened, we have a recording, other people can watch it, and uh, I hope that we can change that. But I cannot make a prediction, you know. I think the, the spectrum could be a very unfortunate development where you have state tyranny like never before. And on a more optimistic note, you will have uh, what we have seen uh, in, the, in the European Union, secession, where, where, where some states just seek the exit. And, uh, and I'm, if you ask me, I'm optimistic if we continue with the work we do, that uh, we make a contribution for the better. Uh, let me just disagree a little bit. I, I prefer uh, that. Uh, uh, so I, I don't see it at all that the Great Reset like, is this big idea coming from socialism. Uh, I think it's a great idea as an idea because it's a rallying cry of people opposing this class. That's what the Great, great Reset is. Uh, listen to Schwab, read his book, uh, uh, that he is really sorry that he messed up uh, with that thing because it's such a great rallying cry and it's, it's just a great slogan for understanding, okay, it's the great and the reset, it's the top-down mindset that you want to address. But the thing about this Davos crowd is not that they are big in ideas. They don't care about ideas. They're careerists. Klaus Schwab has no interest in ideas whatsoever. If you read his book, it's boring as hell. Uh, it's, it's really just mainstream bullshit with but with the agenda in mind, which is not a clear-cut agenda, it's just the agenda of, oh yeah, if just the experts are in charge because you can trust all the institutions and, and who's a young global leader is really a young global leader, uh, which doesn't make any sense if you look at it and you can see it uh, and you got to rather ridiculize these people as Hans uh, is always proposing as I think is the best remedy and not take them so terribly seriously. Uh, there is no uh, character quality as, as with the... Uh, Lenin's and Trotsky's of the past, they are very different class uh, uh, of people. And uh, so I'm, I, I'd say it re rather the opposite way. I think it's a sign of people not caring about ideas because they think that ideas don't matter. And maybe it's the idea that's needed that the ideas matter in the long run. And we should start caring about ideas uh, again and, and not just uh, do the meme war uh, thing, uh, which I find slightly boring. Um, if it's not ridiculing and trolling, which is great. May I add something to the point that some of you now mentioned? Um, can we, should we be optimistic or pessimistic in this general questions? You know, in this general uh, problems we have, is there a tendency that we cannot stop towards a world state via this cartel? Um, intermediary structures to a world state. But, but it's not going there. The idea is age is old, world state, world currency, bank war. It's not going that direction. Obviously, it's going into a multipolar order. There's no, yeah. Yeah. there's no chance that a Klaus Schwab will have an Indian Chinese thing that he's the president of. I, yes, I, I, I share this optimist, this optimism. But they, nevertheless, I mean there are. There are tendencies in that direction, not because of Mr. Schwab. I mean, 
that, that too, that is something to, which is boring, I agree very much, and to, to read, but the question is, in, in fact, in what direction goes the tendency of, of, of humanity, you know? Um, and, and to predict in, in which direction it goes, that's not easy, of course, that's impossible, in course, but there are signs maybe for this or that variant, and, and you see signs for the, 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 the positive variant in, in the sense that a multi-polar, um, multi-center structure, um, we, we, we thought, we, we talked about ideas that the right ideas, so to speak, should should come in and uh, and challenge these status structures. Um, I, I I think a a good reason, a good ground, a good basis to be optimistic, is that the state structure does not correspond to very fundamental structures of. Homo sapiens, you know. I, I think this individualism inbuilt in each of us is a very strong element. It shows that structures can only hold on the long run if they are built in all individuals, in each one or in in a group, in an organized group that is based on the voluntary membership, things like that. The final basis should also always be the the single individual and if and it maybe it's less the question is this good or bad or efficient or inefficient things like that or right or wrong but is it a fact or not and i think it's reality that with this individualism and i think this is the most important basis to be optimistic yeah, I, I would like to defend um, the proposition that we as human beings act according to ideas we have. I think that is very, very important. And most people don't conceive new ideas. Most people routinely accept ideas that they hear in school and university from friends. Just a very few people come up with new ideas. Most people accept ideas that are floating around. And most people do not even know, in terms of the history of ideas, where ideas come from. And when I was thinking about the Great Reset, at some point it occurred to me that the, the, the fundament of the Great Reset, as we can reconstruct it from, from Klaus Schwab and others, um, can be traced back, as, as I think, to the socialist communist agenda. And, and so I think um, it, it's, it's very important to, to change ideas. Uh, I think that is, and that is something uh, Ludwig von Mises pointed out in his work. Uh, for instance, in uh, Socialism, 1922. That we have to change ideas and then we can change the way people act and avoid certain unwanted outcomes, for instance. I think that is very important to take into account. It is about ideas. I want to ask about something most relevant to Professor Holzman's presentation, but really all of you have touched on it tangentially today. And that is about a continuum problem that libertarians often argue about, and perhaps something we can argue about tonight at dinner. And that is, first, how do we identify individuals and organizations that are not the state itself, but are accomplices of the state? And second, what does justice allow us to do uh, with or to those accomplices? So to motivate this a little, I'll give the examples of Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, the military divisions of GE, Honeywell, Boeing. Aren't they just accomplices of mass murder that deserve everything an accomplice of a criminal conspiracy deserves? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, that's of course it, it's important to to uh, to understand with whom you are dealing with, whom you should support, whom can you can, uh, you can trust. Right? So history plays a big role. Some intelligence into the personality, 
um, it's difficult to, to set up a libertarian institution from one one day to, to the other, right? There's something that needs to grow also in time. So you gain trust to people in the course of, of time. And you see what they've been doing, uh, how they're funding themselves, where does the money come from? It's an important question. Uh, what are they doing? Are they doing good things? Are they promoting aggressive uh, things and so on, right? So how should you oppose the evil institution? The, the most important thing is always not to support. Right? You turn off the television. You don't pay anything that you are not, is not really literally squeezed out of you or out of your bank account. You don't support. Uh, you don't applaud people who are talking nonsense. You don't encourage others to, to not or to... You ridicule uh, people exercising power in such ways. You spread ideas. That's what you can do. And we're living in very difficult times. Right? There are these uh, this, uh, several movements playing out at the same time. In the West, uh, we have a movement of increasing centralization. The show is increasingly run by the Americans. And what started off slowly in the 80s, 90s, accelerating at a breathtaking pace in front of our eyes. And, and there's no resistance coming from Europe at all. It's, it's, uh, it is as if you are in a big boat that's running onto the rock on the Titanic. Right? That's what we are, but that's North America and Western Europe. That's not the entire world. I recently had a, a uh, discussion with a student, and she, she was very enthusiastic about ESG investing and so on. So then we looked at the, at a world map where ESG investing is popular, and it was only in North America and in Europe. And even here, it's not, it's very marginal, right? But that, where it's really popular, where people talk about it. So it's only here in, 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 in North America, everywhere else, nobody cares, right? So that's the good thing, right? We are, unfortunately, in the West, we are sitting in this big boat, the Titanic, that is going not steering on not a very good course. And we need to know this, and there's not much we can do. Try to set up any organization that care, uh, brings about resistance, you will be infiltrated in no time. Right? And there's, there's, there's no way to, uh, to, to build up any fundamental resistance to this. So we just need to, for, for many years probably, just focus on not doing any more harm. Uh, just staying clear, raise our families, uh, train ourselves, spread information and so on, for a very long time, this is, will be all that we can do in the West. And then eventually the whole boat will sink one way or the other. That's when we will have a chance. So then we need to be ready. Uh, I have a question for David Dürer. Um, I really liked your antagonism between the red things and the blue things. Uh, it looked like there was a period where the state was getting stronger and you're looking forward to a period where the state is getting weaker. So the way I think of it is, is almost like if I throw a ball you know, into the air, it goes up, there's an apex, and then, then it goes down. Uh, and um, you sort of uh, organized your presentation as if the apex was 2023, like today. But is that what you really believe or what the other uh, commentators uh, believe? Uh, could it, the apex have been reached earlier? Maybe it's going to be a bit later? If you could time it. Um, I'm not quite sure. Did you understand you correctly that you are asking concerning the, 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 the time frame of such developments? Well, well, when when it peaks and that when when the turn comes, so yeah, yeah. Three thousand years, right? Sorry, the old world. Yeah, and the old world. That that is five thousand years. You know, that is three thousand before Christ. So, uh, um, I mean, maybe this has to do with with something I, I mentioned already. I think in that that other speech two years ago, um, all this. All these structures, political structures and so on, are um, also part of a cultural and behavioral evolution. 
Uh, evolution, as one knows, is um, guided by trial and error. Trial with success or unsuccessful, trial or error. And I would say, you know, on, on this very broad view, the statist organization is an error of behavioral evolution. And now there are smaller examples, bigger examples. There are um, the phenomenon as such, that such structures are there. Actually, looking at this out of this distance, these 5,000 years are not very long, you know. Um, the evolution of Homo sapiens itself is much longer. So, a bit like us, there are different theories, could be 100,000 or 200,000 years. Um, there are long periods of culture, cultural developments. It's not the case that with the state, culture comes up. With the state, stone building comes up, and that's why you find more traces to cultural phases, you know. Um, and then they think with the state, culture comes up. But um, I think that has to do how long lasts such an error. And maybe within, within contexts that these developments are not that old, maybe for the reason that it didn't fit into this cultural context, like in Switzerland, I would say this, these are tiny valleys, you know, tiny small groups. Um, it's, it's, it's not by accident that it lasted that long until strong centralized structures came in, while at other places they existed for a long time already. And, and that's why the, uh, the, the possibility, the, the, yes, the likelihood that in such cases it disappears earlier is there, I think. And in other, in China, I could imagine, which has a very long tradition, also not without uh, disruptions. China too, this was not always a centralized big um, organization. There were fights between uh, different uh, uh, entities that then came together. But nevertheless, I think in, I could imagine that there, this point would come much later because there is a longer tradition, it's longer inbuilt. At the end, I think also in China and in maybe other parts of this world, it's against the nature of Homo sapiens. Well, that, that would be the answer of to your question. It's like 85 years, that's what you have done. <laughs> <laughs> For Switzerland, in 25 years, we might have reached. Yes, that, that maybe that was a, a bit, a bit too. <laughs> Maybe that was a bit too precise. It's just funny, you know. <laughs> just funny to celebrate the bicentennial, you know, in Switzerland in 25 years. Uh, I, I disagree, but in a positive sense, uh, I think it's overarching a thing from Mesopotamia has already collapsed. Uh, that's what uh, Wittfogel called the hydraulic societies. And it's not just millions of people being enslaved, it's millions of people surviving. So it's not just the dark side, they solve a problem which has become irrelevant to the technology. We don't need collectivist hydroponics anymore to make millions of people survive in a dense urban concentration, which was the only uh, way it happened. Uh, that's why the Mesopotamian Egyptian model prevailed. It was a solution uh, for a problem. Uh, and uh, I'm not that paleo as you are. I, I'm so always surprised if someone is more paleo than me. Uh, uh, I, I don't think the paleolithic lifestyle in itself is, is like the fullest flourishing of human potential. Uh, I'm rather in favor of catalectics <laughs> or a catalectical cooperation, which means lots of people in differentiated ways cooperating and not just small tribal structures. Uh, but I th think through technology, 
we don't need politics to have that kind of dense cooperation anymore. We can use technology and uh, technology is not entirely to be politicized. Of course, always a tool, but that has been a very interesting uh, race in a sense between the anarchist and the anarchist forces. And it was not always obvious that the ar anarchist forces are prevailing. There was a lot, and fortunately, a lot of anarchy in the Middle Ages, uh, and I think it's coming back, and we're seeing that on the, the international order, and it comes back in other fields as well. Fortunately, not unfortunately. So, for, yeah, so yeah you're, the you're, you're probably right. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I also wish to comment on, on David. I, of course, I liked your conclusion very much, especially uh, 2048. I just cannot believe <laughs> any word to this. Um, I think uh, the, the, the truth is that uh, in any living body, animal, human bodies, there are always lots of parasites, lots of microbes. Some of these help us to carry a living, some are harmful and so on. And so it is with the social body as well. As soon as there's any sign of health and it develops, they're necessarily parasites. I mean, there is, it's just so, so convenient, it's such an easy lifestyle. So the stronger a society grows, the greater is the incentive for parasites and other undesirables to find their, their place. And they always find their place because they are always suckers, as we have said before. Right? And that's, it, it will not change. We will never get back to the glorious days of the Middle Ages and so on. This was a, a strike of great luck because we were coming really out of nowhere. It was complete collapse of, of the, uh, the Roman Empire. It was conquest by all the savage tribes and so on, which didn't have any significant economy. And then we were, we were lucky because there was some decentralization and there was still a cultural uh, unity through the Christian faith. Now, okay, so we were lucky. And that's not our future. So it looks, I don't see that Christianity is on the verge of making a big comeback. So what in, indeed will preserve our, our liberty in the world is decentralization of power. It's not the disappearance of the parasite uh, class. Uh, they, we need to combat them. And it's just a life, it's just the, the, the struggle that you find in any healthy body, right? As long as there's any health left, well, you fight the parasites, you fight the microbes and so on, and you carry on living. There's no easy way out. Sorry. <laughs>